Hello, everybody, and finally, welcome back to that Milan podcast, an official Milan podcast uh, recording. I am Martino Puccio. Alongside me is my partner in crime for the past, wow, over half a decade now, and Matt Santangelo. Um, brother, how are you? Been a little bit. It's been a while, man. I don't, I don't really actually remember the last time we uh, we linked up for a podcast, but... Um... Milan Actual Milan. podcast recording been a bit. We've done a couple of post matches, but post yeah. matches. But I think the podcast itself it's been it's been quite a while, and um, we're going to dive into quite a bit here in this yes. hopefully forty minutes if we can stay on track. Yeah, but, hopefully, uh, hopefully forty yeah. minutes. Yes, yeah, um, no, it's, it's been good. It's been good. Just seeing some Milan wins has been nice. Yeah, well, I mean, we could kind of start there. Milan have won five of six in Serie A. Um, we're not going to talk about, you know, kind of what went down in Coppa Italia because uh, mm-hmm. we already kind of covered that in the past as well. Uh, but, yeah, um, listen, it's a run of good form. We're going to get into the entire match. We're also going to discuss uh, the Roma match a little bit towards mm-hmm. the end and some Mercato stuff, if anything, pops up over the next 40 minutes or so. I highly doubt it. Um but yeah, let's just talk about this. This was another thrilling victory. We have all the goals listed underneath at the bottom. We had all the typical drama involved in a Milan Udinese match. Um, this time, obviously, away. Milan giving Udinese their first victory in the reverse fixture of this tie. Um, Got to be honest with you, I wasn't able to watch live, so my emotions were not the same as everybody else besides mm-hmm. Fatmob updates. Um which obviously resulted in getting everything before the timeline did on Twitter. But yeah, this was a thrilling victory. Milan get out to the lead 1-0 behind a Ruben Loftus cheek goal. Um, I watched the entire match this morning, so I'm finally caught up with everything. Um, Milan really didn't play as bad as half the timeline was kind of suggesting. I think it was, again, lapses on the defensive end and all those individual errors that we have grown so accustomed to seeing on occasion. Um, And that kind of just repeated itself, but we'll talk about this first phase of this match where Loftus-Cheek gets behind there. Giroud missed a couple of chances. Leal created a fantastic one for him. Giroud just didn't take it well. It wasn't so much kind of the finish itself um, on top of it actually being the finish. Um, So, yeah, I mean, listen, Milan coming out, creating chances, looking fresh and healthy. Um, Obviously, the match got suspended a little bit after that, which we'll talk about. But leading up to that first goal... I thought Milan played pretty well in terms of creating chances. What did you see? I'd agree. Um, I think, you know, they had some good, um, you know, moments of, of good possession and, and chance creation and um, being the more dictative presence in the match. Um, I think Udinese, we all sort of know the blueprint um, under Chalfi and really every manager before him um, in recent years um, and the way they're going to play, the way they're going to approach this game. Look, Milan knew they were going to be in for one of those those types of matches. Um, you tweeted and, it too. <laughs> yeah, I, like I, I don't know. Like I just every time, every time we see this team on this on the schedule, regardless of how we're playing, we could have won seven, eight, and how they're playing too. Like it's completely it it's almost like a derby, right? Yeah, it's like it feels like a like a makeshift rivalry between them, even though it's like obviously we it, there's, a, there's really no rivalry itself. <laughs> Um, but the the performance was 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 starting off well. Um, yeah. um, getting the getting the first goal was crucial, especially against a team that you know does have the tendency to just sit deep and want to play that more physical, you know, gritty game, get numbers behind the ball and just defend um, yeah. if the game is tight. So the fact that we were able to get something from Ruben off his cheek, I think that's his fourth goal this season. I could be wrong on that, but. Um, yeah, uh, it was uh, to your point on Rafa, you know, there was a couple instances where this game could have actually been two to three zero. Um, had we been able to be a little bit more clinical in front of goal, which has been kind of like a theme, um, for a while now, but also a few been, years, just a few years, it's been a talking, well, I, not to, you know, go too much into the distant past, but you know, like Giroud specifically, cause I was kind of like going to make the point that, you know, people have been saying that about Giroud where, you yeah. know, he kind of slows us down and, you know, maybe we're not taking as many chances with him up front and with Jovic, there's more built, more mobility and there's more ways for us to play the way of football we want to. Yeah. Um, and then the, obviously the way the game played out, like, I don't know. It's just, you know, you hate to leave games late. We got the victory. Uh, Noah Okafor of the great finish is fourth goal of the season. He's third from the bench, which, speaks volumes to the type of impact he's providing in very limited time 
Um, and obviously there's a lot of things that kind of factor in there, right? Where there's more competition, there's the injury he had and, um, you know, him jockeying for positions on the left side, but also, you know, having to compete now with, you know, that, that Jovic, Giroud tandem that, you know, is getting goals and is producing. And so. then while also being a left winger to displace Leal when they're right. out of a major right. competition too. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, he's going to have to make the most of his chances, but he has like to his credit, like he's, it's, he's been, he's been ready for the call and he's incredible. answered. Yeah. Um, I mean, talk, talking about that. Um, I mean, just to lead up to that, we'll get into it. Um, but the lack of finishing from the starters is pretty evident. Giroud was also battling a fever all week long. Still got the starting nod. To me, I, I again, I really try not to rip on the manager as much as other people do. But when you kind of see something like that and Jovic is playing well, and again, he's proving that, um, I think you just have to start – give Jovic the nod in that. Um, but again, Giroud, seven assists, by the way is probably the craziest statistic in all of Serie A this season. Um, really poor in terms of finishing. It's heavily aided by penalties this season. But again, you're getting contributions. You can't really complain too much. But I think the bigger story of the first half was this. Mike Magnan suffering racial abuse from monkey chants coming from the Udinese fans. Multiple times we have to see this. I, I forget. It was some garbage side that he had this issue with. A year or two ago, I believe it was during the Scudetto season um, where he was facing abuse there. Um, and again, if this happens, we've seen other players from Milan have this issue as well. I think Tomori was one of them. Um, I think it was actually Mike and Tomori in that one match. Uh, for the life of me, I can't remember who the opponent was. But just the fact that this repeatedly happens, and you and I have been doing these podcasts for God knows how many years now. And this is always a subject. Almost every single season, it's one of our players suffering racial abuse or it's happening to other players across the league. We've seen it with Lukaku happen many times. Um, just time and time again, this is an issue for Serie A. They, Maresca, kudos to him for stopping the match. It was stopped around five to ten minutes. Um, they resumed it, and then Samarja ends up scoring. So... To me, I think it was just like a total lapse of like how Milan were just kind of adjusting to that situation. It's really difficult. There's quite a few black players on the team, as everybody knows. So again, even if they were specifically directed towards Mike Magnan, that's that's also a direct reflection of all the other players. And, and mind you, by the way, Udinese's goalkeeper is Nigerian. So again, we're sitting here saying your fans are being racist towards certain players on opposing teams. But yet those are also the players you root for on your team. So like even if hiding behind this distorted logic that Serie A and Italian fans have that, oh, yeah, they're doing anything to throw them off there. It's racism. This, like this isn't uh, anything different but a black and white case of no, this is wrong. You don't do this shit. And if you're going to, there needs to be points deductions. There needs to be a forfeit of the match itself and, and the team that has this constantly happen to this happens to Milan often by the way this isn't like something that this happens like you know once every I, I can count off the top of my head of the amount of time Kemp Prince Boateng this happened to Sully Montari Balotelli like how many players that we could go out through the past 10 years alone that this has happened um and and it just kind of felt like justice that Milan won at the end of this it felt like this was you know to stick it not, not to like say like oh yeah like they won and, and all those problems are going to go away. It's it's just turning into a ramble at this point, but it, I guess they handled it as best you could with the referees. But ultimately, it means nothing if punishments are not carried out this coming week. They should have been carried out this morning. I'm sure they're going to try and help and identify those fans. But your overall thoughts quickly on this, because, this, again, this is just disgraceful um, that this even has to be discussed. It has to be... Uh, mentioned and the fact that the match has to be stopped at a certain point for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, there's really, I mean, I think you, you, you did a, a good job of kind of giving the overarching over encompass. Sadly used to it. They take of it, you know? Yeah. And it's just sadly where I think with us, you know, not maybe necessarily society, I think, you know, um, the sport itself has, I think has done a good job overall and trying to have bring awareness to this issue and, um, it's not just an Italy thing. Um, obviously, we're a Milan podcast, and we're predominantly in the 
couch or Serie A space. So this is what our kind of lane is. And this is where we you know, are, have our eyes and ears on most. So we can kind of pick up on a lot more of the details of these things and be able to give a little bit more of a, you know, deeper um, insight and, you know, understanding and, and, you know, analysis of what's going on and what this issue is. And, you know, it's just where we, unfortunately, a lot of people have become desensitized to it. And when you see these things happen, it's almost just like a, oh, just another day in Italy, just another day in Serie A. Oh, nothing's going to happen. Of course, nothing's going to happen. You know, a tone deaf tweet, say no to racism. And then it's like, <laughs> keep it pushing. And yeah. that's not the answer. That's not the solution at all. And the fact that we're still doing this in 2024, after years of previous incidents, right? You just mentioned all the Milan players, right? That's just And Milan I missed players. some, and I missed some. And you and all you missed some, right? Like, I don't have these specific details on, on the certain matches and the dates and the years, but like, of course, yeah. it's just, there's a lot. And because they're, and, and as a result of there being a lot, it makes it that much more like, wow, like there's been a lot and we're just so used to it and nothing's changing no matter what people are universally saying across Twitter and, you know, in these spaces where people do have a voice. Oh, Baka is the do. worst of all. Even, even not even just Calcio, like even his, you know, international team teammates defending, you know, coming to really rally around him and, and, and you know, support Mike Manu and Mike of Kylian Mbappe. Like this is, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a major issue. And, you know, unfortunately, we were still having to have these discussions. We do have to have these discussions because we can't just come here, you know, with an audience, with a community that we have, you know, that is very diverse and, you know, all over the world, we have different people and we're very accepting of everybody, right? Like this is, it's, it's a club. We're all the same, you know, yes. we all support this club and, you know, we're all here to have a say and, you know, be together as Milan fans. But, you know, the fact that we have to continually address this for minutes on end, like we're talking four or five minutes about racism in 2024, it's, it's 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 disappointing. It's disgusting, and I'm hoping that you know, with all the rallying around Mike Magnon from his teammates, from the league, yeah. from you know, global football, and you know, hopefully, you know, even the local authorities who I know they um like they're trying to work with Fondazione Milan um to build you know to raise awareness and to, to do something off the back of this. Um, I'm hopefully we get some change. Um, I just think, and I'll leave it at this. Yeah. It, it says a lot about how these are uh, these instances and these occurrences have been happening for years now and when they happen your first first thing to go to i don't know if it's you but for me i'm like oh the the, the, the federation ain't gonna do anything yeah of course just because you you haven't you don't have a track record you can't give them that trust and faith yeah, I was calling them you're going to address it so you're almost just saying like anything that you guys put out on Twitter, social media to say like, say no to racism. It's just like, it's, it's, it's incredibly, it's bullshit. It is bullshit. And you want to know the perfect example of it. We could pull up the Serie A Twitter, right? So we see this situation in which Milan are leading. Okay. It's one nil. Then the racist incident incident happens yeah. where they stop the match. Okay. They tweeted that locked his cheek scored, whatever they're promoting the league, usual thing, how it happens. Match breaks because of the racist incident. Incident. No tweets were made. Game resumes. Samarjic ends up scoring, um, which will kind of transition right now. They post about the Samarjic goal, but they don't say anything about the racist incident. So you're not only doing anything. It's like you're glossing over like it never even happened. Right. And you're it's, basically it's a, sitting yeah. there saying to yourselves, oh, yeah, now we're going to tweet about it after all the bad backlash, right? Why does it have to take backlash from, from the Twitter account, right? Because the, the fish rots from the head down, right? So this starts up with the people that employ those guys, and it goes on down the list. And mm -hmm. you'd see it because this is just a systemic issue. There's no plan in place, right? There's been so many incidents like this. You would have think, Sadie, I was like, okay, we've seen this happen way too many times. Here's a plan that we're going to implement that if this were to happen, we stop a match or we kick the fans out. Or if your club or your fan section has been accused of these racist stuff and it's been proven that they're acting like this, you ban them for maybe half a season or like a handful of matches for like one strike. And then if it happens again, you continue to do so um, and make the punishments more severe where it ends up that your club losing loses points or they're not allowed to have fans for an extended period of time because it's clearly not working. No. Um, 
And the fact that people are like, oh, well, you don't want to ban them for a handful of idiots. When they came back out, by the way, this is the last point. When they came back out of the tunnel, they were booing Manyan. OK, they were booing the rest of the players. So not only are they tone deaf, the entire the large majority of the people within the stadium itself didn't even realize what was wrong. And the fact that they couldn't even rally around the guy because, hey, guess what? Players on your team are black, too. So if you're going to root for that kind of shit and don't care, then that's a reflection of what you guys are and what you represent. And it's disgraceful. Um, and unfortunately, from watching it, it kind of felt like Milan were shaken up a little bit. And and I'm not blaming all the goal, uh, the other goal like this, but the first one, it just it just seems like this was a total breakdown of miscommunication. Um, the midfield again, it's just an incredibly high line that all these guys play with. And there's just so much exposure at the back, and especially with a player like Kier, um, who is clearly not himself or what we saw the best version of him. Um they concede again, and then they end up going behind to uh, Talvin, who used to be a target of the club a couple of years back before he went to Mexico, and then he finds his way back at Udinese. Um, incredible. Um, not that he was there before, but he find his, found his way back to Europe. Um, just again, these these lapses, and this is again Milan blowing a lead. If they're up 1-0, then they end up conceding 2-1 answer. Uh, just your overall thoughts of, of that. Is this is this something like, okay, yeah, when we get our top dogs back in defense, this will probably not be as likely. But this is actually the main reason as to why they're not even in the title race at this point. They can't hold leads. It's a concern. Yeah, it's a concern. And I think, look, you can kind of put it down to a lot of different things. I think, you know, the stoppage, because I think at that point, you know, Milan were playing pretty well. Um, and when you have to stop the rhythm and this is the distraction and you feel like your players – um, you are shaken up by this and rightfully so, and then have to come back in and sort of switch it back on. I mean, we're not, I've never once complete competed at a level as high as this, right? You never yeah, have yeah, yeah. like, obviously. Right. But in, in the heat of competition, you know, especially like an important game and, you know, every game is important for this club to get top four and to, you know, to sort of, you know, get their season back on track you know, these games are important. And with that and the heat of competition, like you're locked in mentally, everything, you're giving everything to the game. And for you to kind of switch off and then 10 minutes, okay, back in. It's just, it's, yes. I think there was a lot of things that kind of factored in there. I will say that I don't think this was necessarily um, as is indicative of the way that Milan have been playing because in a lot of their recent games, we haven't seen errors like this bad. We haven't seen choppy play as much i mean patches here and there there's still some things to iron out you know but even the game against roma like they won that game they 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 commanded that game um and even the games previously right they were more or less in control so yeah um, i i don't i don't want to put too much stock into the the the, the defense and how they fared in this game because we all kind of knew the nature of this game and what it was going to be anyway we knew it wasn't going to be simple we knew it wasn't going to be one of those games where we went two, three, zero, and Udinese just lay down. They get up for us. That that always happens. Yeah. Um, but the fact that we got a win, I think it shows a lot. If this this match, it's weird and it's unfortunate because of the circumstances that 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 took place. But this can be that one singular moment where I think we really start to make even better strides forward. We've been playing yeah. well. We, we we discussed it at the top, right? One five of six. We Correct. had the other draw, right? Um, against the Learning Town. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I know. It's just the most annoying thing to look through the picture. In between the Coppa Italia game, right? So yeah. I think that, you know, given how, again, this is a bogey team that really gives us fits. We had to go on the road. We've been playing good, right? Results wise, but better on the road, too. We, as can, of we can argue that, you know, we're better than what we've shown. And I think that's because we held ourselves to a higher standard coming into the season. And the fact that we were able to somehow get two new two guys off the bench that are newcomers, they get goals, and we win the game with a late winner from Okafor, who just came back recently from injury, and we're able to do so and sort of rally around Mike Magnon in a winning fashion mm -hmm. away. That's massive because I think you look at what that does psychologically, all the 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 things you had to overcome to get to the victory. And then having to do it so in that fashion, 
I think is something that you can look back and say, like, even when, when, when they got the goal, look at, look at Adley, look at all those other players going to sprint towards Manuel. Like this team, like this is a unifying moment for the team. That was a great, that was and I a think great this is, this can be one of those matches that I think really cements us for, for, for top four. And I'm not counting anything as guaranteed at this point because sure. we have to wait and see, but between the results we've been able to stack up despite having some matches where we've kind of left it laid and had to like cling and claw onto victories. We're getting guys back, Martino. We're getting Tomori back very soon. We're going to be getting, or, you know, soon. Ciao, Kalulu. Right. Like we're going to be getting guys back and we might be adding some people in the January window. So I think that it's a, it's a 180 reversal of what we saw at this time. And Esther Chukweze as well. Right. Um, Last thinking. year we were spiraling. We, we were, we were having a horrible time in this in the month of January. Roma, the Roma, the Roma tie started it. Those results to follow. The fact that we're able to play good football, at least results wise, and with things still to improve upon, shows that we have another level to us. And I think that now, when you look at the 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 upcoming group of fixtures, those teams like you know the the Inters, the Uves, you know the top dogs that we're kind of jockeying with for top four. Um, they don't want to play us because, like, man, man, Milan are finding resolve. Like, they're finding their rhythm. I think Inter will still want to play us, but yeah, yeah, of course, I agree of course they, yeah, they have her, they have her number. <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm saying. Like, I get what those teams say. that would like they looked and they weren't fearful of, of Milan, yeah. but they know the fact that we're able to pull out matches like this now and we're getting guys back. I think it makes us a scary proposition for for anyone right now. Fourth and fifth choice center backs for an extended period of time, still getting results, virtually undefeated over the course of like, you know, you know, a third of a half of a season. I yeah. know, I know that sounds funny out loud, but I mean, it's just true. Six matches in, uh, in consecutive undefeated. And I think it even goes back further. Um, but yeah, just overall, I, I think you're right about that. Milan, you know, even if they are leaving some chances on the field, um, they're, they're finishing quite a few. And it comes from guys like Luka Jovic, um, Noah Okafor, as you mentioned. And then again, if we just want to bring out our good friend, Scout7 Calcio, who just has this great statistic, Noah Okafor and Luka Jovic scored today, make it nine goals scored from the bench from Milan this season, which is the most joker goals in Serie A. Again, I think this is just a testament to the work that has been put over the summer, giving this team more depth, particularly in the offensive side of things. So to just see that happen, I think it's just a major thing for Milan in the long term. And the funny part is, as you mentioned, too, uh, with the injuries in defense, it's not like the offense has been completely healthy. How long it took for Jovic to get assimilated with the squad? Noah Okafor, I don't know if you noticed his celebration yesterday after his goal, but he didn't celebrate on the knee slide like he did last time. So he made sure he didn't get himself injured. But again, it's sort of that uh, inconsistency from some of these players, but yet, they're there scoring these goals. And I have to say, what a great mental turnaround from a player like Luka Jovic. I, I don't really care. You know, like e even if I was harsh, I'm harsh in the moments in which he should do better, right? And we also praise him in the moments in which he does well. Almost every single time this guy comes on or he's getting an opportunity to start and get a good amount of minutes, he's been producing. And that's all you can ask for from your backup or even your third striker at times. Luka Jovic has been an integral part of this team, helping them accumulate so many points. I believe he was the one who also scored the tying goal against uh, Salernitana, by the way. He scored the game-tying goal at the moment against Atalanta before the Luis Meriel uh, miraculous goal. The guy has been phenomenal um, coming off the bench like that. And Noah Okafor, too. I just want to keep on giving love to guys like this. Dude, like it's so difficult to be injured like this, not getting consistent starts, playing in a new league, a new team um, as well, and just producing. As you mentioned, four goals, they're not always coming from the starting position. I, I thought he's just done so well, and even in the appearances he has made where Milan aren't necessarily going for the win, like against Roma, as we mentioned, the, the first tie against them, coming onto the field. Just holding up play, drawing fouls. It's little things like that that make him a winning player and why that signing was so impactful and why I loved it initially over the summer. So kind of just talk about these two and why they've been so massive for me. I know you touched on it a little bit, but just further in depth because these guys now are going to separate Milan from the rest of the top four pack um, because 11 points with a game in hand so far is huge. What makes it very important, that stat that you brought up, the nine goals off the bench, is 
that we're getting results. We're on a good run right now. Again, one five of six in the league, pretty cozily in the top four. We're in third right now. We have what, in, as of right now, eleven points. Game in hand, we're eleven points 11 up on Fiorentina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're 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 sitting pretty right now. Again, it's not a, not a guarantee. It's not a certainty. Things can happen. Injuries can pile up quickly. We know it better than anybody. <laughs> yes. Um. But the way the the fact that we're able to go on a run like this of results, of positive results, build a cozy lead um, in that in that position that we have for the top four, um, and do so when our best player is not scoring goals. I granted there's more to his game than scoring goals, and he um, has been getting assists occasionally. A lot of assists have been left on the pitch by the inability of others to finish those chances and get on the end of those. Um, but I think it says a lot where – Man, like Milan's MVP hasn't scored a goal since match day, what, four, five in September? Against Verona. Against yeah, Verona. Yeah. Like, we're talking, like, months. He's had goals in the Champions League and Coppa Italia. Yeah. Months, months without a goal in Serie A. Milan are in third place. With all the injuries we've had. So, like, I think I, it's almost strange in a way, but it's almost like I can almost understand where the, the Pioli in camp can come from. I'm not saying I think that Pioli should stay beyond the season. I think we it's yes. through the, yes. the report yes. saying that there should be a natural end to his cycle. And I believe that I is going to be the case. But I think at the end of the day, you can look at it and think like, Pioli had a lot of injuries, maybe some down to his training regimens and the play, people he has in, in roles that are, have, you know, an impact there, fine. But you throw everything in the pot, injuries, everything. And you're like, you know, in third place with an eleven point advantage right now. Leal hasn't scored in it's five. What, 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 and and like, Inter Inter and Juve are on historical paces, like right. very, like very phenomenal. Like Juve don't concede; they're a fantastic defensive side. Inter yeah. are champagne football, like every week. So yeah, I, I, like, and the expectations, as you and I know, we both want them raised. We both want them to win almost every single game. Well, actually we do want them to win every single game, <laughs> but like how realistic is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, it's, this is what, what we're seeing here um, is what we kind of had and I had in mind for this season, right? Like Milan would be able to get produce production off the bench from guys other than Leao and Giroud. We've seen it from Pulisic as a starter, six goals, I think five assists in setting off maybe a couple extra and all competitions to add on to that. So he's been very good for us. You can make a case he's been our best player um, for a um, large yeah. part of the season. Um, but the fact that you're able to get Okafor to produce off the bench, like winning goals, Luka Jovic doing the same thing, and we're getting it in really different spots of the season where it's like if it's not Pulisic scoring goals, okay, yeah. then it's like Okafor going on a little bit of a run. If it's not o if it's not uh, Okafor, then it maybe it's Jovic going on a little bit of a run. Like we're getting guys to get timely goals, and even Teo. Like we haven't talked about Teo, but his last five games in all competitions, I think he has four assists and one goal, mm -hmm. playing as a central defense uh, defender in most of those games. So like the way Milan have been some able to navigate the season and the difficulties that have come off the back of the injuries and you know. Um, the disappointments in the Copa Italia and the Champions League, they're valid, but absolutely valid, right? We, course, we left yeah. a lot out there. And you can make a case that we should be still in both those competitions. But you have to kind of look at what the what the games are in front of you and what the schedule yeah. uh, around the bend looks like. Europa League and, is still a possibility. Like, again, we're getting guys back. We're probably going to add another piece or two. We bring back Matteo Gabbia, who... Has played oh. well. Let's talk about Matteo Gabbia. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I was here, gonna but... shift on over to to some of the other players that made a real yeah. good impact. Um, do you want me to take it on Gabbia, or yeah, you want to expand we, we, on? Yeah, we could do we could do a Gabbia, and then let's. And jo I want I want to make just a real quick point, by the way, too. Uh, with with goals coming from everywhere, three players with five or more assists in the league. We have Pulisic, Leao, and then Giroud. Miraculously, seven assists is just really Giroud impressive. Giroud might finish the season with double digit double goals digit, assists yeah. at thirty at thirty seven years old. However, you slice it. However, he got yeah, those goals yeah, yeah. is another conversation. But if you told me all space business, baby. Giroud was going to have. 10 goals and 10 assists at 37, I would have been, nah, you're crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but listen, man, that's it's results-based business. I don't care how you get them, you got them. Um, yeah. And again, just kind of expand to this, right? 
Gabia, I thought he was fantastic yesterday. Yeah. Getting getting to rewatch that, just talk about clinical tackles at the right time. Oh, just like yeah. just the technique with the tackles, physically looking better because he has his legs underneath him because he was actually getting steady minutes. Good for him, man. Good for him. And by the way, Yasin Adley, really good shift. Really good shift, I thought this was. Um, just didn't make that many mistakes. He really seems to be adjusting in the role. Almost every single time, I don't know if you feel this way or if others feel this way as well, comment below. But you've seen Adley, almost every single time he touches the ball, you just know it's going to be a fantastic pass. It just the technical ability that he has on the ball is just so, so good, man. He's one of like the more technically gifted midfielders we've had at Milan in the past 10 to 15 years. And I know it's not a very long list, but he really is morphing into a better player. I think it bodes well for the future. So man of the match with this uh, real quick, and then you could talk on these guys. Man of the match. Sheesh. I, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with Mike Magnan for this one. Um, just keep keeping his head on a swivel with this. I, I know it's maybe not the best on pitch performance from him, but just to mentally stay in the game um, and, and do a good enough job for me, I'm going with him, but there could be a couple of players that you could pick from, from this, but uh, just quick on those thoughts. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's Magnan because I think that it's, it shows a lot about his character um, and, you know, not just, you know, having to come come off the on off the pitch and then restart and you know, do your job, right? At the end of the day, like we look at them as footballers, but they have a job to do. This is their job, right? Yep. So imagine you were going to your job and someone was racially abusing you and you yep. feel like those powers in in charge weren't doing enough good enough job to combat that or to support you or defend you or to, you know, uh, you know, uh, address the situation correctly, right? So for us to be able to come out um, and still play and still, again, taking the two two one deficit and then us being able to rally around Mike Magnon, rally around as a group and get late it late ish here. goals late ish goals i mean we got two in the last what 10 minutes you know, yeah right there 83rd time. and then the 93rd like, is stoppage yeah it's it's again it says a lot about you know what the group sees in Mike Magnon. so i think if we're you know look you're not going to maybe this wasn't maybe his best game. He's had games where he's had miraculous saves and maybe there wasn't a lot of singular moments in the match where you could point to and say, Mike Magnon made an incredible save. That's why he's top fill in the blank goalkeeper, or that's One. why he is deserving of X amount of wages per year. But I think there's a lot more to his game than, you know, what he does on the field. He's a leader. This guy's a leader in defense, and I think the 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 the, the uh, leader in, in goal, excuse me, the defense looks to him. The players look to him. The yep. the entire team looks to him as a source of inspiration and leadership. Mm -hmm. So the way he carries himself is so important, and he's so crucial to what we want to do going forward. So I, I think that yeah, he's he he would be my man of the match, and I think um, you know again, it's 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 a it's special to have a player. <clears throat> excuse me who's this important to the team in this position because goalkeeping wise ggo wasn't this type he was a great player for us but ggo wasn't that i feel like he didn't have that sort of like leader quality about it it's he like, it's like, he, like he, he did when he was younger before the first contract renewal that that's just like my opinion like it just a, a little bit but i i i, yeah. I just see i just you're see right. different i just see differences in um and my way Benio. different personalities right totally right like different. Like yeah. the, even like the social media posts, like the way he carries himself in the post match interview, the things he says, like this guy's a true professional, and I think it says a lot about. This is my final point on on sure. Manon, but I think it says a lot about the direction that this club has taken in recent years, where you can look up and down the team and you can really point to three to four guys who, if they were wearing the captain's armband, you would be like, yeah, totally. I mean, even before Tonali, but like Tonali, like a lot of these guys, like you look and you're like, these guys have captain like qualities and the capabilities mm. to be able to lead and to do it in certain difficult moments. Mike Magnon's one of those guys. Yeah. He's absolutely a captain like so, type of player. It's a, it's a trademark of Moncada scouting of what Maldini and Masada were building. That was a, were that's a really good point. Too, it was the, it was the they, types they, of they look, for, they look for those certain things James, when they James are trying to captain. acquire players. James Horncastle wrote yeah. about it on the athletics. So um, you would have to go back a couple years, but um, 
you guys just go and search it up about James Horncastle interviewing Maldini and Moncada, uh, just basically about the overall profiles in which they recruited for Milan players, um, and it's shown. Um, and I think TG Reinders, by the way, too, even if we want to go to the new management, I think that's another player that's like high character, high motor that you want to have. Um, just quickly, uh, Milan, uh, we destroyed Roma. Um, it, it was really just like a no contest. In my opinion, they were playing very sluggish in the final game of the Mourinho era. Shout out to Wayne Gerard for coming onto the channel and helping us out. Obviously, Wayne is a good friend of both of ours. Um, he does great content for Roma. Um, happy for them that they uh, just got their victory against Verona yesterday. Um, again, listen, uh, Pioli undefeated against Jose Mourinho, like everybody knew he would be, um, sends him packing. Roma haven't beaten Milan since post-COVID. It's just really been uh, a tie that favors Milan in so many different ways. And like usual, there was a penalty in there. Um, great to pick up those three points. Get six overall from Roma this season. It's just a, it's just massive when you're talking about overall fixtures. Again, when Milan drop against some of the lesser sides in Serie A, they had to come and pick up some against, well, they're not a top side right now. They're ninth. But um, again, that's where you pick up stuff like that. As far as Mercato goes, we'll get into that. But your quick thoughts on the Roma match and, and what you saw there. Um, probably can make a case it was our best win in this stretch of games. I feel like as far as, I mean, I don't know, that's maybe tough. Yes, to yesterday it just felt more rewarding. Right. There was the reward in that It could, due to everything that happened. But I feel like at home at San Siro um, against Roma, a team that we've really had a great run of games against um but the way we did that i think the goal aside that we conceded like the teo hernandez goal as well like i think you kind of look the at the laser everything. oh the Giroud teo link up yeah yeah it was That's it was good. yeah that was it was a match i looked at and i was like oh yeah we 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 commanded this game and it was one of those matches you looked i didn't really have any doubt about just because again like we 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 know how to play against roma we know how to play against roma we have a really good record against them um Despite the the two two dropping right at the beginning of last yeah, year, yeah, it, it was an aberration, yeah. But yeah, we 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 uh, we commanded that game, big victory for us, and uh, you know it's nice to get the season sweep of uh, of Roma. We got to see if we could do that against Lazio as well. Yeah, which we've won three of the three against the Roman clubs so far yeah. this year. Uh, I think it's on the road against Lazio for the next one. Um, Mercato-wise, listen, there's been links with center backs. I don't envision a striker coming in, especially with the growth decree issue happening. There's been heavy, heavy links to Buongiorno. His agents were in Milan. Um, they were pretty much discussing with him. It seems like they're very open to this move. Um from Buongiorno's side, but as we know, with Urbano Cairo and how he likes to operate with business, the guy's going to hold out for an X amount of money. There's been talks of a deal with cash, plus Lorenzo Colombo, who not a great performance today against Empoli. I was watching that one, um, and overall, he can't really solidify himself as much as I like Colombo. I would like him to have a future, but let's face it now. It's been around almost 18 months now out on loan. Lecce Monza has not been able to solidify himself has had moments of looking competent, but overall, not really too much. In my personal opinion, if this continues for the next couple of months, obviously the rest of his loan with Monza, there's no doubt in my mind you have to kind of move on from him. Um, and, and I wish him the best of luck, but if there is some value there and if other clubs value him around $10 million, you have to take the money at that point. Um, as far as center backs go, Di Marzio is saying Lenglet, is someone that is is at the, at the top of Milan's list right now, which is not great in my opinion. We had some links with some other Ligue 1 players as well. I don't envision a player actually coming in here. We obviously got Terracciano um, and Almeria, who just ended up losing against Real Madrid in stoppage time, which was a match that looked like it was fixed. Um, Luca Romero going out on loan for there. Hugo Cuenca, that's the name. Um, I think he'll be getting called up soon enough. Um, business ain't going to really happen right now. Do you do you actually see a center back coming in? If it is, I think a loan type deal, dude. I, I don't see anyone that's think, coming uh, here for the long term. No, I think that Milan were looking at Rondorno heavily because I think they're trying to get ahead of the market. I think if it yeah. gets into the summer window, you leave yourself more competition to fend off for him if you really do truly want him. Um, so I think they're kind of trying to you know gauge interest there, maybe – your structure, the more 
you know, formal details of a deal. But I think the asking price is going to be too much, especially in January. You know, Urbana Cairo, um, he didn't do us any favors for Beloti six, seven years ago. He ain't going to do it for us now. No. Um, no. So, and I think a lot of, in a lot of these instances, like I think it's very rare that a club is going to want a player to in the, in the deal, like they just want straight cash and they want to be able to go out there and get, they have to really like that player to like, you don't see players plus cash in many deals like this. I mean, it happens a little bit more often now. I think, I think it was just, it wasn't, it was, it was the cash part of the Milan side. That wasn't no, that's sufficient I'm, enough. No, 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 I know. But just to yeah. clarify for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, I, I think that there may be some value in a Colombo, but I don't think there's going to be enough there where it's going to be a position much where Milan is going to spend 30 or 25 million on a central defender um, in January. I also think Gabia coming back and having some good matches here, um, it kind of gives you a little bit of a boost and probably an out to say, Hey, like we got Gabia back. Like Gabia is playing well. Like we don't need to go out there and get another defender. We have Chow coming back. We have Kalulu coming back. We have Tamori coming back. Like, I'm not saying I agree with that approach, but it wouldn't surprise me. For like, hey, we're, we're good as we are. Tarciano, like he, he can play a full, 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 full back positions. And we've seen Taylor Hernandez play a central defense. Like I can see them saying like, unless Buongiorno, the price is right there. We're not going to do anything. And um, I agree I with it. that. Yeah. Do I agree with that? No, I'm saying I agree with that. I'm not sure if you oh, do. I, oh, I agree. Yeah. Like if, yeah. if you're going to get like priced out, like what you're saying, there's no point in biting if you don't necessarily need it. If you're holding your own, you have this gap between third and the rest of these teams. Like what are you really trying to overpay for? Right. I, it just, it just doesn't make sense. You could yeah. revisit it in the summer if you could just survive and you know you're getting those center backs back. Yeah. I don't think you need to bite. Uh, is just kind of I what think, I, think. I think. Look, I think Milan's market, January market, is going to be defined by opportunities. Like the January market's always been an opportunity type period. Opportunistic. Yeah. Yeah. Like they they never really go out. I mean, they went in there a couple years ago and they had a lot of injuries and they really do did need support in central defense. So they went in for Samakin, and then the Samakin thing fell apart, and then they got Tomori, right? On really favorable. Uh, John Claire Todibo, Todibo as well was Todibo, the other. right? Like they, they, and they, they wanted um Kabak, right? Kabak too was another player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on Kabak, yeah. So, like, they went in for Tomori because it was like, hey, we got him on loan with like an option, and we got a really good deal on this. So yep. if they're not able to get their deal for it, yeah, this management has shown us they're not going to go and spend like like irresponsibly and, and, and with emotion, right? Like I just highlighted it. Like Kyer can play one game every week, maybe every two weeks. And if that's against very select opponents, so he's on his way out. Florenzi's on his way yes, out. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be getting a lot of these guys back. I just think that they're not going to start spending here. I think they're going to say we're fine as we are. Europa right. league is coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll see out the season. Hopefully we stay healthy, get top four, and then we'll reassess things in the summer market where, you know, you have a little bit more time to. You have some coins coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to, just to kind of like touch up on like what the outlook will kind of be like. It's obviously January 21st. There's one match left within the month of January. It's going to be against Bologna. Um, I think they have more than adequate players to win that match. Um, and again, then you're kind of looking at Frosinone, Napoli, and then the, the runs match. Um, again, if you get those types of players back, the schedule isn't that insane at this point in time. So I agree a hundred percent with you. Uh, again, I tweeted out something, uh, last week, just really quick before we wrap up here was about the Ketelare, uh, the Salamaker deal, the Rade Krunich sale, which we kind of really didn't mention. Um, and then the Messias, uh, buy was triggered by Genoa. So that's a 3 million euro package in total. You could see guys like Colombo and Pobega also be getting sold. And then CDK with his option, more than likely going to be picked up by Atalanta. You're talking about anywhere between 50 ish million. Um, depending if it gets triggered, I truthfully don't see Bologna reaching that 10 million figure. Maybe if they sell a Xerxes, uh, we could see kind of something like that happened. But again, um, Minam will have some money. You make top four. We're talking about near 100 million euro kind of market again. Um, and then things can get really interesting there. Um, and you're talking about wages being relieved as well. Giroud doesn't extend. Kier and Florenzi outside the door. Whoa. By the way, Florenzi gets second most wages out of uh, – out of uh, their full, could be, it could be more than a hundred million. If if you're in, in the camp that believes we're going to sell a player, 
but they'll get sold. And again, too, from, from what I understand from people that are kind of like involved and know things within the club or follow it very closely, they're saying this and I'll leave it on a positive note that, um, they still spend certain money that doesn't go past that minus 60 million number that they can't hit, right? They can't spend, they can't go past minus 60 in a financial year in terms of spending. So they were, the, what they were essentially saying was that the Tonali money really wasn't touched as much as some people would like. And that kind of goes along the lines of what Paolo Maldini was saying. Yeah, our budget was doubled after I left. So what initially what people were saying were like, yeah, of course it was doubled because of the Tonali sale. But why would Maldini make comments like that if he knew that about the Tonali sale? Yeah. So which leads me to sort of believe that money was actually coming from ownership. If that's true, remains to be seen. But again, really quick, just I, I know because because we don't get to talk too much as much as we'd like to. Um, if you're given 100 to 120 million you're not doing what we did last summer, right? Where it's kind of spread out around 10 players. For me, I'm kind of like, get three to four players in that 30 to $40 million range. Um, or even for sakes, like me, I want Benjamin Sesco. If you have the opportunity to spend 60 million and they're willing to accept that at Leipzig, you go and spend that money for a player like that. That's just my opinion. Do you kind of agree with... Uh, hey, let's go in and get more of a solidified, blue-chip, really talented type yeah. of player that we yeah. know that could play here, right? You don't want to do this like, no. hey, 10 million no. here, 15 million. No, right? I would I would try to upgrade at right back. Um, I, I know people are going to have their own uh, feelings and opinions on that because they see WD Clever, he's the captain. Um, but I think that that's an area that Milan, if I'm being honest, can improve upon. I don't know I what agree. the market presents for that position i don't you know i don't claim to know the you know the right pack market and how deep it is and the price tags on the top players but i do think that's an area that if you really wanted to maybe move the needle a little bit more you can say we can upgrade it right back and it can make a difference because now you're looking at you know a great left back in Teo hernandez and a really solid right back and then you already have your defenders and you maybe you you have gabia back and you have you know, Kalulu and you have Tamori and then maybe you go out and say, Hey, Bongiorno is one of those guys we want to bring in. Yeah, I have yeah. Bongiorno, Tamori, Chow, Kalulu, Gabriel. Chano is pretty much going to be a player like that. Finish, there's talks of, there's talks about, yes. Guy. Oh, so now it's like, oh. now all of a sudden I think that there's that having that conversation, but I think that there are some areas of improvement that could be made even in strengthening the midfield. And you look, the best teams always find areas to improve. We, we, we're not going to be foolish and say, hey, we have a better team than last year. Our midfield's solid. We're, we don't need to get better in the midfield. You're telling me if you can sell Povega for $8 million and get like another midfielder like a Ricci or someone like that. Dude, if oh, uh, Ricky is uh, – Ricci is just – I'm just saying – I'm just saying like I think yeah, there's yeah. areas where you can you can elevate your floor player. Whatever your floor worst midfielder is in that, mid, in that midfielder, midfield area, if you can say, hey – our worst guy is now this versus this. Yeah. And that's kind of what you want to do. We even did that this past summer in the attacking department, right? Like if Pulisic is doing what he's doing, he's already upgraded over Salamakers and Macias, right? Yeah. But let's say Chukweze, who is a more expensive player, who is your backup, who's away on yeah. AFCON duty, and he's – so now your backup is better than both of your starters from last year. From a title winning team, from a title winning team, right? So, like, that's yeah. where you start to kind of have these sort of conversations. Backup strikers as well, and that's how you really elevate your profile. That's how you really elevate your team. Now, we don't even know what the situation is going to look like with Olivier Giroud. He might say, you know, I'll stay another year. The, the, he, I'm, I don't think it'll be a matter of wages. I think, like, if he truly wants to stay and Milan want to keep him, they'll give him a very short, like, inexpensive deal. But my just thought process with him is at 37, he might look to go and say, hey, maybe I'll try a little bit of the MLS. Like he yeah. might go there for a year, like the Chiellini type situation where you go there for a year and you you head off and you retire. Yeah. That's kind of how I see it. Um, but now all of a sudden, maybe Jovic is your backup because Mo Jovic costs us nothing. Jovic as and a two get, is fantastic. Like you get Jovic as your two. And let's say you do go out and get a Sesco, right? So like you could kind of piece together the market and you really look at what the framework of this team could look like. I think Milan fans are clamoring for what you were just saying. Like 
instead of getting five to six players at 20 to 22 yeah. million, which is kind of what we did this past summer, it's mm-hmm. now three to four at that 30 to 40, where that's where those types of profiles typically on winning sides across your oh, like, like the needle. Yeah. Yeah, and not necessarily like Fratesi. I never thought he was kind of worth forty million. But like when we were talking last summer, we didn't like that move. Even say we were to have liked Fratesi, it's just like Milan shouldn't be spending a third of their budget on one right. player when they have right. so many holes. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. It wasn't a conversation of we didn't like yeah. the player. It's like. Well, forty. We don't like the player for that yeah, We have six other needs. Like, there's so much more nuance to the conversation, and yeah. people think it's just sort of like FIFA. I um, mean, I saw people kind of argue it. It was like, okay, everyone agrees Milan have a ton of holes. So, how do you fill the holes? Is it just getting three players for for the prices that we were just talking about? No, it's about getting all those players to plug in those positions where you have Chukwueze, Okafor, Jovic, Reinders, Loftus Cheek. You have all these types of players where you start filling holes. Terracciano starts to make uh, himself a name. And you start promoting guys from in the youth team. Right. And then you're selling other players around where everybody's like, they're going to sell Ateo. They're going to sell Manyan, They're going to sell these guys. They're going to sell Rafa. And it's sort of like, well, now they're making the Champions League consistently. They're selling other players who might have not had a key role within the squad. And all of a sudden, you have a budget near $100 million again? Hey, you don't have to sell those star players. Then you get that 100 million budget like we're talking about. And hey, investors are coming in through as well because we know their loan needs to be replay, uh, repaid by the end of 2025. There's positivity in the air. And how does this all in, the, in this entire conversation? And then this is my final point. And how does this all sound? And how does this all factor in when you're sitting across the table from your perspective and possible new coach? You're telling yeah. me uh, with, we'll with, you're telling me that you're not presenting this package of players that we currently have and the Primavera players and also the budget and you know, the, the the lifting of a lot of the restrictions we had in years prior. I'm not saying it's going to happen. The rumors of Malta and Conte are not going away. But if you're sitting across the table from Conte and you're thinking like, hey, we can give you a good budget which is what he always wants. That's why he left Juve the first time. That's why he had his differences at Inter, amongst other things. They couldn't spend maybe the way he wanted. And you sit across the table and offer Conte, hey, we can give you a really great wage for you. You bring in your own guys. You get the slate of players that we have available to you right now. And we can go and spend and get the players that you need that feel like will make the difference for next season. How does that sound? Yeah. Who else is offering that to, to, to Antonio Conte? And, 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 and again, you're Milan. And your Milan, because Inter's not changing coaches. He he wants to come back to Italy, right? He wants yeah. to come back to Italy. He's been turning Inter, down now. They're not changing coaches. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Juventus are not changing coaches. Allegri's got this back on track. He gets paid a lot of money. Napoli, I don't see it. Are, no, are we have a well, better right now the mid season, and and that situation is oh. so so bad, honestly, that it just doesn't make sense. I'll just say this, and again. 10th final comment. Um, I think the Conte stuff is not going to go away. No. And I think I think that is a very real... I know they're saying like Mota and they might not pay... The, there's, And I'm not even saying Martino. I don't know no, how don't. you are. This is another conversation we could have. And I know people have their own opinions on Conte and whether or not he's the right guy for Milan because his projects are very have been short-lived and he has differences yeah. with management and people say it's going to be different this time. And then it's just not people said that about him at Tottenham. He got his pot of Tichy, He got his guys. He got Kulisevsky. Uh, and then he left. Right. Yeah. Like, so whether you think it's, he's the right guy is a different conversation than whether or not you as Milan and as a fan of the club can go and say, can we get Conte if he wanted to join with the package that we would be offering him? The answer, I think, is definitely yes, because he wants to come back to Italy, and I don't think there's a, a more appealing project available in Italy for him than not a chance, not a chance. That is looking for not a chance. And also, like again, with Napoli, if you want to talk about it again, just on paper, they don't stack up long term because Victor looks like he wants his way out. Like it just, yeah. and I don't see them having the personnel necessarily for that. The defenders either. Um, I think there's, I think Napoli are going to go in a different direction. I think they yeah. go for like an Italiano type, not saying him specifically. I think just 
along the lines of a manager of that like tier coaching where they're at right now. Um, but again, guys, you've given us so much support over the past few months. We're rocking into 2024. Um, again, if you haven't already subscribe to the podcast on Apple and Spotify, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter at that Milan pod, follow Santangelo everywhere. It's been on the ticker the entire time at Matt underscore Santangelo at AC Milan bros. Um, and again, as well for me at Martino Puccio, um, underscore Martino Pucci on Instagram. We're going to have clips coming out from this podcast. We really appreciate all of you that watch, that listen. Um, we're hoping to get more guests over the course of the next few months. I know the schedule has been rocky. I apologize for that. I have no control over it with the new job, and Matt obviously has his job as well. But again, we appreciate the support. Comment who you guys thought was the man in the match for this past week. Any final comments, Santangelo, before we end right here? No, it's a good, it's a positive time. And I feel like we're, uh, you know, making our way into February. You know, we got Europa League coming up in a couple weeks. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we can, we're starting to cement ourselves for top four. Like, let's, let's finish this season strong. Like, I would love to get some really positive results. I would love to win something over Inter. If we can't win the title and they're going to get their 20th before we do, Let's make it difficult for them. Like yeah. let's let's not lay down to enter. So um, yeah, let's let's keep it pushing. We're 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 winning games. We have areas to improve upon, but the results matter. It's a results based business, and Milan are getting results right now. So let's let's keep it moving. Yep. Um, appreciate you, Santangelo. Appreciate all you listeners. Um, uh, other than that, thanks guys, and uh, see you next time.